St James's Palace is located in the city of Westminster in London. Henry VIII ordered the construction of the palace in the 1530s on the site of a leper hospital dedicated to St James the Less. It is thought that Henry wanted the palace primarily as a hunting lodge for deer. Anne Boleyn stayed at St James's the night after she was crowned queen. Queen Elizabeth I rode out from here to address her troops when the country was threatened by the Spanish Armada. But it would seem that some former residents refused to leave. Ernest Augustus was the fifth son of King George III and known as the Duke of Cumberland. Rude, obnoxious, arrogant and brutish to those around him, unsurprisingly, he became one of the most unpopular men in London. Late at night on the 31st of May 1810, Ernest returned to his chambers at the palace after visiting the opera and having a general night of debauchery. Shouts, cursing and loud noises were heard coming from his chamber, but palace staff knew better than to interfere, as this behaviour was commonplace for the Duke. Later, the Duke called for his valet, Cornelius Neal, who was fast asleep in the adjoining room. Neil awoke to find the Duke standing in the centre of the bedchamber, his shirt covered with blood and his blood-stained sword lying on the floor. The Duke exclaimed, Neil, I am murdered, and the Duke went on to declare that as he entered the chamber, he had been ambushed, had only managed to save himself from death by using his sword on the assailant, and was terrified that there was an unknown assassin on the loose. Neil declared that he intended to pursue the assassin, but Ernest insisted that he wake the other servants up, ring the alarm, and to call Sir Henry Halford, the Duke's physician, at once. Having examined the Duke, Sir Henry Halford declared that the sword wound to his right thigh was superficial, but the cut on the Duke's sword hand was deep. Asked to recall the events, the Duke explained that he had retired to his four-poster bed when he felt two blows to the head. He awoke, but didn't glimpse the attacker, but as he called for Neil to help, the intruder ran through a door, fleeing through the yellow room towards the ballroom, then towards the summer bedroom, and through the dressing room towards Celis's room. Joseph Celis being the Duke's other valet. Two hours had now passed since the incident, and the room was restored to its usual opulent elegance. The Duke asked Neil to fetch Joseph Sellis. Neil's sworn statement regarding this was as follows. He went straight to Sellis's room, where he found the valet propped up in bed against the headboard, his head almost severed from his body by a frightful gash, and a cut throat razor covered in blood at the opposite end of the room, too far from the body to have been used by Sellis himself. On the opposite side of the room was a half-filled sink of water in which somebody had tried to wash away the blood. An inquest followed and the Duke gave his explanation of events. Clearly, Salis had tried to murder him, inflicting several blows to his body before fleeing back to his room where Salis, horrified by his brutal attack on the Duke, took his own life. This was an unlikely suggestion as the Duke was heavy and large-boned, whereas Joseph Salis, the Italian valet, was small-framed and slight. Probably due to the Duke's status, this version of the events was generally accepted as accurate, and the official verdict was that Salis had committed suicide. The Duke of Cumberland was declared to be innocent. The outcome of the trial was always overshadowed by doubt. Several key witnesses were not called to testify. It was also clear the physician felt the wounds were not terribly serious. He concluded 
that there was no danger to the Duke of Cumberland's life. How could a sabre-wielding assassin with a sleeping victim manage to inflict so little damage? Many wondered if the Duke's injuries were indeed self-inflicted to disguise the real events of that evening. Despite the verdict, the London public felt that the Duke had no redeeming features and were not convinced that the Duke was innocent. Rumours and gossip quickly spread. Stories differ, but some believe that the Duke had seduced Celis's daughter, or possibly his wife, who then took her life on discovering she was pregnant with his child. Scared that his servant Joseph Celis might be prepared to reveal the Duke's scandalous private life, the Duke, possibly with the aid of Neil, had attacked poor Celis while he lay in bed, holding his hair in one hand and cutting his throat with the other. He then used the razor to inflict wounds to himself before returning to his own bedchamber to stage the scene of an apparent attack. The Duke's popularity couldn't have been any lower. He was openly booed in the street and so hated that he hardly dared to show his face in public, eventually moving abroad. The Duke eventually fought in the Napoleonic Wars where he became liked and respected by Captain Charles Jones, who worked as his aide. Just before Christmas Eve of 1815, the Duke's guilty conscience caused him to confess. He wrote, Swear to me, dear Jones, that you will never divulge what I am going to say to you, for my mind requires relief. You know that miserable business of Celis, that wretch. I was forced to destroy him in self-defence. The villain threatened to propagate a report and I had no alternative. Salis was buried at a crossroads, the customary tradition for suicides, with no Christian gestures or blessings. He was buried secretly, for fear of crowds, midway between the bottom of Northumberland Street and the gateway into Scotland Yard. The area has changed considerably, and it is thought that his body lies near to the Sherlock Holmes pub at the junction of Northumberland Street and Northumberland Avenue. His lifeless body had a stake driven through it, but this does not seem to have stopped his restless spirit from roaming. His gruesome spectre is rumoured to haunt St James's Palace, particularly in the chamber where he died. The appearance of his blood-drenched corpse has been seen lying on the bed, just as it was when he was discovered centuries ago, with his mouth hanging open as if to scream, throat hideously slashed and his clothes and bed covers drenched in blood. Some say he returns on the anniversary of his death. Others are convinced that the sounds of scuffling noises, cursing and shouts of a violent struggle have been heard along with the sickly sweet stench of blood that seems to accompany his horrific, grotesque phantom as he wanders the palace corridors. In the 17th century, two apartments at St James's Palace were presented to two well-known and notorious ladies. The Duchess of Mazarin, previously the mistress of King Charles II, and Madame de Beauclerc, previously the mistress of King James II. Both ladies had, it seems, been replaced by newer, younger women, and in effect they'd been offered to retire comfortably in St James's Palace. They became best friends, spending their days together, reflecting on their colourful past and enjoying the luxuries bestowed upon them. They spent hours in deep conversation on many varied subjects. On more than one occasion, they would discuss what happens when a person dies. Was the soul immortal? Is there evidence of apparitions? And is it possible to return to the earth after death? Not long after this, the Duchess of Mazarin became very ill, to the point where her friends were gravely concerned. On hearing this, Madame de Beauclair visited her friend and reminded her of their promise as the Duchess lay dying. Weeks, 
Months and years passed with no sign of any communication from the other side. Madame de Beauclair began to lose faith, becoming disappointed, sceptical and bitter that her friend had not returned to her in proof of the afterlife. Finally, she declared that in the future, when she died, that would be the end of her. A few months later, whilst playing cards, a friend of Madame de Beauclair received a message begging her to come at once to St James's Palace to see Beauclair if she wished to see her friend alive. Sadly, the friend had a cold and not wanting to pass it on to Beauclair, she politely declined the invitation. A few hours later, another message arrived from St James's Palace, this time accompanied by a casket of jewellery, including a watch and a necklace, once more imploring the friend to visit Madame de Beauclair. Worried, the friend left with a servant and hurried over to the palace. Expecting to see Madame de Beauclair on her deathbed, she was astonished to see her looking healthy and well. However, Madame de Beauclair explained that she had, in the last hour, been visited by her deceased friend, the Duchess of Mazarin, and she knew that she would be dead in a matter of hours. Madame de Beauclair described the encounter as follows. I perceived not how she entered, but turning my eyes towards yonder corner of the room, I saw her in the same form and habit she was accustomed to appear in when living. She took a little circuit around the chamber, seeming rather to swim than to walk, then stopped by the side of the Indian chest, and, looking on me with her usual sweetness, said, Beauclair, between the hours of twelve and one this night you will be with me. I began to ask some questions concerning that future world I was so soon to visit, but she vanished from my sight. The midnight hour was rapidly approaching, but Madame de Beauclair showed no signs of any illness. Her guests tried desperately to cheer her up. As soon as they began to speak, Madame de Beauclair suddenly declared, Oh, I am sick at heart, and collapsed. Despite the best efforts to revive her, Madame de Beauclair was indeed dead. She had passed away at precisely the time the ghostly visitor had prophesied. <laughs>